shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's home. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much a joy. The psalmist says, happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith and who executes justice gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. Amen. 
Psalm 41 says, How blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive, and he shall be called blessed upon the earth. And do not give him over to the desire of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed. In his illness you restore him to health. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's pray again. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to light the Advent wreath together, to reflect upon the meaning of the coming of the Incarnation the first time. And we thank you, Lord, for your coming into this world to give us grace and mercy and forgiveness and to give us the redemption that we need. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together during this beautiful time. We thank you for all the symbols of the season that are around us. Help us never, Lord, to descend into materialism. Help us to always reflect on the spiritual nature of the day. Help us not just to want to get it over with, but help us, Lord, instead to savor each moment that we have with family, friends, church family, and with you. Lord, we pray today that you will bless us as we worship you, as we think of those on our prayer list, as we think of the needs of this world around us, the needs that are so uh, striking, especially as we see the videos from our missionaries and others. We pray, Lord, that you would inspire us for your service, that we would be wholeheartedly committed to reaching the lost and to teaching your will to this world. Lord, we pray that you would help us to shine like lights in the darkness during this season of light. And we pray, Lord, that as we worship you today through reading your word, studying your word, and singing your word, we pray, God, that you would inspire us and fill us with your Holy Spirit and send us away strong. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your power in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are going to continue our marathon singing of Christmas carols. Our first Christmas carol will be, while shepherds watch their flocks by night, we will sing the first verse. Then we will sing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. We will sing the first verse. And then we will close with Silent Night. Well, not close, but next song. Which we'll sing verses 1 and 2. So stand and sing. Thank you. 
morning. It's beautifully decorated as the sanctuary is. It's not half as beautiful or not nearly as beautiful without people in it to look at as well. So we're glad you're here. Turn around, welcome your neighbor, and notice some of the beautiful uh, garments that have been uh, decorated uh, in, as well. And we're going to have some birthday celebrations here with uh, some special treats being handed out. It's nice and cold, so it's a good day for hot chocolate. So this month we have Pastor James, and we have Jennifer, and we have Donald. And somebody on that list is turning 80. We'll let you figure out who you are. <laughs> I'm not saying who, but somebody is. I told him he couldn't say who. <laughs> You're looking good, James. <laughs> so let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.
We're just thankful for all of those that participate in each service year after year and week after week. Lord. We just ask that so many in this world don't know about the great story you've told. And we just pray that you'll give us the strength and the courage, Lord, that we leave today uh, after this service, that we might have the strength and courage to tell others about your love. Sponsored reading number 718. Thank you, Tara, for the carol of the bells. And if you're wondering where the bells actually are, they are on the bulletin board in the hall, in the vestibule. So be sure to take a look at the bells when you on your way out. Don't know if there are any other bells. I'm going to keep looking. So number 718, the people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Amen. Thank you for reading that along with me. You know, the scripture is full of all kinds of wonderful things. And for some reason, this Christmas, this uh, passage of scripture... I wanted to include it for sure, and this is a good week to do so. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10, and we're going to look, meditate more on uh, verses 11 through 18. And this is the idea of the good shepherd. And you know, there are shepherds here uh, at the manger scene, and there they are. I really only see one with a shepherd's hook, but these three fellows here on this side represent the shepherds in the Christmas story. So let's take a look at these verses. I'll read them through and pray, and then we will get started. 
John chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will come, they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. And we pray, Lord, that we will remember this each day of our life. We pray, Lord, that we would know what goodness truly is. That we would know your love and your care for your flock. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives up his life for his sheep. It's kind of the, the whole summary of this message. You know, the Bible is just full of great things and it's packed from cover to cover with images and ideas that many of us have learned from the time we were little. And here is one that to me is just very, very important. One of the best images. God wants us to understand who He is. And He wants us to understand what He's thinking by using the image of a shepherd. Now, think about that. We are real familiar with it, but we have to think about what is God trying to tell us by having us think about the shepherd. You know, the church these days is probably one of the only places you can go to where they're talking about shepherds. Uh, you know, you won't hear them talk about shepherds too much, you know, at Walmart or, you know, Bojangles. So, you know, it's only one of the few places you'll ever hear anybody say even the word. And we sing it at Christmas time, don't we? We'll sing about the shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. And I think a lot of people have no clue what that might even be about. So when Jesus says, he declares here, that I am the good shepherd, that may be a big, big understanding. I think Jesus is really saying even more, and that it doesn't come across in the English very much, I am the ideal shepherd. I am the best shepherd. I am the most awesome shepherd that ever could be. So it's not that he's saying, hey, I'm not a very bad shepherd. I'm a pretty good shepherd. He's saying he's the greatest. So to understand this, what is a super shepherd? What is he going to be? What is the most awesome shepherd going to look like? Well, in the same breath, Jesus says, there right in verse 11, and as you can have seen, he repeats this, the good shepherd gives up his life for his sheep. The good shepherd gives up his life for his sheep. Well, the good shepherd then must be a, a crazy person. Because who in the world would die for a bunch of old smelly animals? Who in the world would, would do that. You could actually get some more animals, you know, pretty easily if you live to tell the tale, right? I mean, you could go get some more sheep. But Jesus is drawing out a truthful, really great picture. Of course, he's not just talking about sheep. He's talking about people. The ideal shepherd is a servant of great, great power whose focus and desire is given over to his people and to their goodwill to the point of self-sacrifice. He is the ultimate in servant leader. He leads by serving and serving in the ultimate way. 
Now we think, we imagine probably not too many shepherds actually died. But we do know that shepherds did risk their lives back in the old days. You know, they fought off thieves. Can you imagine in the ancient world, or even today in some Bedouin cultures, which are still there probably right now, fighting off those people who would like to come and steal a sheep or two, right? That would be dangerous. So shepherds have fought off thieves. They have frightened off the jackals. You ever fought any wild dogs? Now, I can tell a story, but I don't have time. But you know, wild dogs, they can be very scary. Jackals, how about hyenas? Some of y'all might have hyenas in your life, you know, living near you. Sometimes I can hear them close to our house at night. Laughing. You know, yipping. Huh? Laughing. Laughing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Laughing is a little groovy, you know, but that's, that's what they call it. But anyway, shepherds have stood up in the ancient world and stared down the lions. You know, mountain lions, people say, oh, they're cute and cuddly, and if I see one on the Appalachian Trail, I'm going to just pet his little furry head. Just like my kitty cat at home. Not the same thing, right? So, think of this. Sheep are popular among jackal, jackals, hyenas, and thieves, and mountain lions, and whatever. In spite of their smell, they're popular. So what would you do? How would you handle this sudden stress of a bright summer day ruined as your peaceful prayer is interrupted by movement out of the corner of your eye. There's the good shepherd. How would you handle it? On the fringe of the herd, you see not the dirty white wool that you're protecting for your employer, but you see a flash of dirty yellow brown in the sun. You only have a moment to decide if you will stay motionless and safe and let the large lion have one little sheep from the fringe of the flock, what will you do? You only have your voice. You only have your staff, your clothing to make a big scene to attract the big cat's attention. Safety is in silence and in peace. Duty is in responsibility and action to do something if it's wrong. Would you risk your life for a sheep? Would you risk your life to do the right thing, to do what is right? Would you risk your reputation for a lost soul? Would you do that? Would you risk rejection in order to make an inquiry about someone's soul? Well, you and I, we don't happen to know where the sheep are. We just, sometimes we assume all of God's sheep are in the church. But you might be somewhat incorrect on that. There are other sheep too. So Jesus had this ideal as a shepherd. He had this idea. He declared his virtue and his ideal as a shepherd. He wants people to understand that this is how God is. And that's just what he wants to do. And so now he's making comparisons here to make it plain. Verse 12, hired workers are not like the shepherd. They don't own the sheep. When they see a wolf coming, they run off and leave the sheep. Then the wolf attacks and scatters the whole entire flock. Well, that's pretty clear. It's a pretty clear comparison. We've all seen bad customer service, haven't we? Bad customer service. You know, maybe some of you have given bad customer service. It leaves us with this feeling, why don't they care? Kind of like this. Let's just say, this has of course never happened to me, you have a thousand bucks in your pocket. And you actually want to buy the item. And you've already made up your mind before you ever go get it. What is the challenge? The challenge is that you have to do a lot more than just want to buy the item. You have to literally plan 
how you're going to get the item away from the people who are guarding it at the store. Now, it isn't that you're going to steal the item, although that would actually be easier in some cases. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You actually want to buy it. You have the money and you're at the store, but here comes the salesperson. Here comes the help. The party who must sell it to you. Will you be able to get your item away from them and into your vehicle? Oh, maybe, you know, maybe it's an auto part that you can see up on the shelf. You know it. There it is, right there. But they insist on looking it up. And then they tell you that you need something else. Maybe back in the old days, this has actually happened. You go into a Christian bookstore. Remember those? And you ask about the item, and instead of looking for it, the employee says, no, we don't have it. They don't even bother to offer to order it for you. You know, it's like, no, we don't have it. And it's over. Or maybe you're somewhere to get an estimate. No one ever gives you one. <laughs> I'd like to get an estimate, though. Maybe you'd like to ask a question just to be sure, but no one there even knows what you're talking about. Customer service. And we wonder, why don't they care? You know, the fact is that it is hard to get people in a materialistic culture filled with entitled narcissism to think about on which side their bread is buttered. It is hard to do. Jesus says that when a challenge comes, when the wolf attacks, the higher hands run away in an act of self-preservation. Verse 12, right? An act of self-preservation. Now, who is he talking about? Well, I think here our own comparisons to Jesus must stop his uniqueness comes through. He will never run away. He's talking about literally everyone except himself. That's the truth. And, you know, preachers like to say, well, I'm not, I've never run away. You know, the preachers think they're talking about that other preacher down the road. You know. But he's literally talking about everyone but himself. He alone is not a hired hand. He alone is is the owner of the sheep, and that is actually the main point of the story, which seems to get missed a lot. Verse 13, hired workers run away because they don't care about the sheep. This care for the sheep, concern for the ones in your care, it's not so much about self, it's about concern for the ones in your care. And we can relate to this, everybody can, I hope, somehow, in some degree, we relate to this with our families. We relate to this with our children. Maybe if we have students, we're concerned for our students. If you have employees in your care or your manager or anything like that, you care about those. You care about your co-workers, right? We aggressively care for our children if we're normal, right? Pastors are to exhibit care and concern for the people in their congregations, not so much for themselves, like you might see some today. But Jesus is here talking about the kingdom of God in the big sense. He's talking about care. He's talking about how we should trust in him because he's the good shepherd, because he cares for us first. He cares for us. He's watching over us. Even when we, like sheep, are not even paying attention. If someone doesn't care, they flee the kingdom of God in times of trouble or danger or if the wolf attacks and they are getting, while the getting's good, as my Uncle Ralph used to say, and they are or were like careless hired workers, day laborers who have very little time invested in the situation. What does a shepherd have invested in his sheep? What does he have? Invested. That flock is not a hobby. That flock is not a hobby. That flock is his entire life. It's his entire future. His livelihood, his legacy, his nest egg as they were, his retirement account, you might say. His provision for that very day, that very week, you might say. So Jesus has invested his very life 
into his sheep. He shed his blood for the sheep. He has given his spirit to guide them, to improve them, to wash them as, what does the Bible say? Whiter than snow. So Jesus cares, and Jesus knows. In verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and they know me. So there's a parallel here with Jeremiah 31, 34. Those verses around there where the new covenant uh, prophecy talks about how they shall all know me. They will, no one will teach them because they will all know me. They will all be born again. That's why we're Baptists. Because the new covenant is that covenant in which everyone in the covenant is born again. And there's a recognition. Jesus knows his sheep. So like sheep, just don't follow any old shepherd. They recognize the voice of their own shepherd. Jesus' people are not deceived. They recognize his influence in their life and his calling on their life. And they hear him. And don't think this is necessarily just some private, spiritual experience. I saw someone just the other day. Very popular videos. The Lord spoke to me and showed me this prophecy. And this person begins to talk about the most amazing nonsense you've ever heard in your life. But because it's religious, she has 987 billion views, right? And people are just glued to it. I don't understand that. I don't understand. It was complete nonsense. Psychotic even. But there's a billion views. And everybody, oh, click the like button. Ooh, you know. Here we go. Jesus' people are not deceived. They recognize his calling in their lives through the word. Jesus will speak directly to his servants, directly to his witness. To, I mean, through his witness. The Bible. Jesus will come and deliver a message, maybe in a variety of ways, but it will always come through the word. You know that? Maybe it's a song based on the word. But anyway... Someone might approach us and say something that we're certain is from God that drives us to prayer and to scripture. Your pastor may spend hours preparing a message, not for entertainment value or to get approval from somebody up in the sky, but straight from God with authority and power. That's where God's word comes from. Knowing is as natural to those who know as not knowing it. To those who are perishing, who just don't understand a bit of it. Jesus is not running around trying to convince people, begging for understanding, trying to coax the sheep to join the flock. You know, have you ever, you've probably heard me talk about coaxing the horses back in the barn back in the day. Remember that? I have to get out. What was the secret weapon? It's the sweet oats. They can tell. 200 yards away if you're in the sweet oat barrel because it makes a sound and you stick the scoop in and they hear it and they go Whoop, and the ears go straight up and then and there was one that would come running back you know I mean, you know if you have a horse running towards you what is your main wish I hope that horse stops because <laughs> they look like they're not going to stop they'll run right up to you you know anyway long story but coaxing. Are we like that horse? Are we waiting for the Lord to give us a nice handful of oats before we trust in Him? Are we playing games with God? Boy, He is our good shepherd. Do we really know Him? He knows us. Or do we only know the outward trappings of religion? Kind of hiding out following other sheep, never really hearing the voice of the master. Jesus said that his sheep would know him, verse 15, just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I give up my life for my sheep. So we can, again, trust Jesus. He's given it all. His care is boundless, even to the point of his own self-sacrifice. The ultimate grace that we have received that begins in the manger 
and continues all the way to the cross at Easter. He is at one with the Father. God isn't just doing one thing in Jesus and doing something else in someone else. It's all about the Lord for the whole world. The mission of Jesus and the disciples, the mission of the Baptist Church, the International Mission Board, is the mission of God. It is about knowing and being known. And it, that must always be true. Verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them together too when they hear my voice. Then there will be one flock of sheep and one shepherd. So, this is all about one flock and one shepherd. One flock and one shepherd. This is what the culture around us doesn't understand. They say, well, Jesus is just one alternative. You know, Jesus is just one way. People don't really need the church. Probably any other way to God would be fine. This is what the world believes today. And this is very much the same as it was in Jesus' day. So we need to show people how deep their sins are and how they're headed for judgment without the help of the Good Shepherd. But you and I are bearers of that special message called the Gospel that really should come into focus during this time of the year. That Jesus has taken the penalty. He has laid down his life and other sheep are brought in. Jesus didn't come just to save the Jews because, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm Jewish. But he came to bring people together from near and far, from then and today. So we see Jesus' goal. Is it our goal? Is it our goal? When we ponder our service and our Christian life, do we understand the goal of outreach and evangelism? And we think of making the church a welcoming, safe place for people if they know about church. So Jesus continues to speak, making sure that people understand the sacrifice of this very best shepherd of all. Those people out there that are not of this flock, they need to hear that we are praying for them. That we're not just here to entertain. We're not here to make people feel good about themselves. We're here to offer the gospel of Christ. As he says... The Father loves me because I give up my life so that I may receive it back again. No one takes my life from me, but I give it up willingly. I have the power to give it up, the power to receive it back again, just as my Father commanded me to. So make no mistake, this is a willing self-sacrifice for the sake of the sheep by the all-powerful ultimate shepherd of our souls. Our God is not scared off by the wolves, and so we don't need to fear. God knows what is coming up, and he knows what's going down. He gave so that we could exist in him. God has been working to build the kingdom of God for thousands of years. History has witnessed to his interventions, to movements of the Spirit, and so God is asking us today to put our faith in the Good Shepherd this Christmas. He's given all that he could give, all that there is. He's shown us that he will not run when the wolves of life come. Will our faith waver? Or are we strong? Are we strong? Are we in the sheepfold hearing this voice of the one we know? who speaks through his word today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that you are the good shepherd. We thank you that you are risen from the dead. We proclaim, Lord, the glory of your birth. And we thank you so much for the second birth that you give to us. We pray, Lord, that you would make us your sheep that we would hear your voice and that we would know you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. There's a way in a banquet. You will sing verses 1 and 3. Stand as we sing. God bless you all.